Timing is everything. And in this video, I'll show you an easy way to figure out the best time to start your seeds. Knowing this sets you up for success by transplanting seedlings at the perfect time so they won't suffer from transplant shock and they'll grow up healthy and strong and be able to fight off pests and diseases. Here's another reason why timing is important when starting seeds. For example, if you procrastinate starting your seeds, then your seedlings might not have enough time to bloom or mature into, say, a ripe tomato. On the flip side, if you start seeds too early, then you may need to pot them up to the next larger size container. And if while waiting for the right conditions, you don't plant the seedlings into a larger container, well, they can become root bound and stressed. Which means they can bolt, that is, go to seed, succumb to pest invasions like aphids, or simply die. These tips are easy to follow and put to work. And they're the same ones I've used for over 35 years. Now, if you have any questions, please add them to the comments below so we can all benefit. I try my best to answer your questions as soon as I can. Hi, I'm Marion Owen, the Gardener's Coach, where I help you grow your dream garden using super easy organic gardening techniques. Now I'm sharing these seed starting tips with you so you can avoid the confusion I went through when starting my first garden in 1985. Even before the internet, the amount of do's and don'ts and what to do and what not to do was overwhelming. So today I'm going to walk you through step by step what worked for me and still does to this day by sharing a segment from my Seed Starting Secrets workshop that I ran recently. Here's what you can expect to learn today. What are frost-free dates? And how do they work with climate change? How to best use the information printed on seed packets? Which seeds should be started indoors? And which seeds should be directly sown outside in the garden? What should you watch out for when transplanting seedlings outside? What steps can you take to simplify the process of knowing what to grow and when to sow? And be sure to stick around to the end because I'm going to show you two techniques I developed some 35 years ago that really helped me get organized and out of overwhelm mode. So let's dive in. Let's say you want to grow kale. You do like kale, don't you? Begin by referring to how to grow information. You'll find on the back of seed packets and reference books, seed catalogs and online. For kale, see what the seed packet says start seeds four to six weeks before your last frost date? Most resources will refer to the last frost date or frost-free date as a reference point. All this can be very confusing because a region's frost-free date is now a moving target thanks to climate change and severe swings in weather patterns. In Kodiak, Alaska, where I live and garden, the official frost-free date is May 16. I now prefer to focus on when you plan to transplant seedlings outside. So if your garden is truly set up to protect seedlings, and I'll talk more about that in a second, it is possible to transplant kale seedlings, which are quite hardy in the garden as early as April 1st or so, almost six weeks before the official frost-free date of May 16. Now to give you a heads up for what's coming up next, 
the slide after this one will be a series of three slides, actually. The first one shows you the number of weeks to start certain vegetable seeds before transplanting them outside, followed by a similar slide for flower seeds and then herb seeds. Feel free to stop the video to take screenshots. And I'll also post this information for you in the description below. So in this case, we're gonna look at when to sow seeds indoors for transplanting outdoors. Our example is kale. Let's say our goal is to transplant seedlings outside on May 15th. How long do seedlings need to grow before transplanting outside? Well, we learn from the seed packet four to six weeks. Therefore, counting backwards on the calendar, you want to sow seeds for kale on April 1st with that goal of transplanting outside your seedlings on May 15. Now, here's that first slide I was telling you about. Here's the number of weeks to start vegetable seeds before transplanting outside. Now you can see that vegetables that take the longest, as in 10 to 12 weeks before planting outside, now we're talking, you know, three months, include celery, leeks, globe artichokes, and onions. Eight to 12 weeks, green or spring onions, peppers. Six to eight weeks, so that's, you know, two months. Tomatoes and eggplant. Four to six weeks, Swiss chard, your salad mixes, lettuce, a lot of your kale or coal crops, I should say. Zucchini. Now, much of this will vary if you're growing in a hoop house or greenhouse and your conditions might call for different timing. But let's go to the second slide here. Here's a number of weeks to start flower seeds, including like 20 weeks. Check this out because 20 weeks, which is like five months, right? This is when you start your fuchsia seeds, your sweet pea seeds. Now, a lot of people think, well, that seems like really early to start sweet peas. But if you want to enjoy a long bloom of those lovely fragrant flowers, then I suggest starting them a lot earlier than what the seed packet tells you. 12 to 14 weeks, pansies and lobelia. 8 to 12 weeks, snaps, alyssum. 6 to 8 weeks, here's your getting into your biggies, calendula, daisies, nemesia, and so on. 4 to 6 weeks, here's your marigolds, nasturtiums. Okay, for herb seeds. 12 to 14 weeks, here's a lot of your, like your chives and other kinds of onions, um, oregano, mint, yarrow, and parsley. They take a long time. Three plus weeks, excuse me, three plus months to get them to a size where they're transplantable. Eight to 12 weeks, thyme, chamomile, as in your German chamomile, feverfew, and so on. And here's your big chunk, six to eight weeks, which is dill, coriander, sage, and so on. You see there's basil on the end here. Some people like to start their basil even earlier to enjoy an earlier crop. Now we've looked at the number of weeks to start vegetables, flowers, and herbs before transplanting them outside, but these are plants that adapt well to being transplanted outside. And they are generally improved by the process. But other plants, like carrots and radishes, mostly because of their fleshy roots, should not be transplanted. So let's look at some examples of direct sow versus start seedlings. Here we go. Again, feel free to take screenshots here, and I'll post these points in the description below. Now, looking at this chart, we have three groups. We have sow seeds direct in the soil. Now these are plants or these are uh, yeah, these are plants that just don't like to be transplanted. So you wanna put them in place outside in the soil without starting them as seedlings. This is generally speaking. I do grow uh, or pre-sprout beans and beets, uh, spinach at times, sometimes turnip. So it does depend on your conditions and how gentle you are with transplanting. 
The second group, sow direct or grow with seedlings. So these can go either way. And the third group is grow seedlings for transplanting. These are the bulk of your coal crops or your cabbage crops. A lot of your spices like oregano and thyme, cilantro and basil. Um, so these are plants that actually um, benefit by growing and then transplanting. So whether you sow seeds direct or you start them indoors depends a lot on your climate and whether your garden is set up to protect plants against wind and frost and snow and heavy rain, lots of sun, and so on. In other words, do you have covers or mini hoops set up to protect seedlings? And by those, I mean, you know, when you're getting ready to transplant your seedlings outdoors, this is one of the most critical points in your seedlings life. And if you take care of them properly, then you'll know success. For us, uh, late winter and early spring, even though we cover these raised beds, we have to be very careful. But we depend a lot on these mini hoops. And that's because weather conditions, if plants are exposed to heavy rain, like on the left here, you can see the difference that these mini hoops will make. Um, in the middle diagram, we've got cold air which will settle down on top of one of these hoops, these mini hoops, and then sort of settle down because cold air sinks. And you can see that poor wilted plants on the right. And yet the plants inside the dome are nice and healthy and protected. And on the right, you have heavy wind, which we all deal with at one point or another. Again, the plants that are inside the protection of the hoop are okay, and the other ones are getting completely blasted. Protection can also come in the form of uh, netting, fine mesh, or thicker mesh. Uh, these milk cartons, which I use by cutting off the bottoms and not just setting them on top of the plants, but I punch a hole on the top of the handle and poke through the handle all the way down into the soil a length of heavy duty wire to anchor them in place. Hoops are also used for the process of hardening off seedlings. And speaking of direct sowing versus transplanting seedlings, now here is a view inside of our hoop house taken in late winter. The bed on the left was planted with seedlings of Chinese cabbage and broccoli and kale. Now, these were started indoors five weeks before. The bed on the right is filled with rows of see, seeds of spinach and turnips, cress, uh, mixed salad greens alternated. Now these were directly sown in the soil about two weeks before I took this photo. Here is the same garden two weeks later. Now here's where I want to share something with you and I promised in the beginning of this video. I found this very, very helpful, especially back when I was starting my first garden some 35 years ago. All the information that I was researching about how to grow stuff was so new and overwhelming, I simply had to get organized or I knew I'd get discouraged and end up fuddling my way through gardening. So I did two things. First, I kept a journal, which included drawing a plan of my garden. This was nothing fancy here, just what I had in place at the time and what I wanted to add later. I sketched plants in there, I doodled ideas, used colored pencils, I uh, stuck in pictures from magazines. It was and continues to be my roadmap. The second thing I did was I created a chart of what I wanted to grow. Then I looked up important information for each plant 
or variety. I learned what gets written gets remembered much better than making a spreadsheet. I mean, that I can only speak for myself. Okay, we'll give it a try here. And I'm using my stylus, so bear with me. It's going to look a little cryptic. So uh, let's say we want to start with kale. All right. And we know it's an annual. So I'm going to put an A there. And this is what I did when I was just researching so many plants. I just, I had to create some sort of chart, right? Days to germination. I learned that it only took about five days, maybe even less. And did I need to direct sow it with a D or am I going to transplant kale? Well, kale actually is better as a transplant. You can grow it at a cut as a cut and come again vegetable, but start transplants. We learn from the seed packet four to six weeks. So we're going to put like a four here. Great. Spacing between plants. I didn't know at the time, but I have fairly deep and fluffy raised beds as in raised bed soil. So about 12 inches between. And then notes can be, you know, weather, uh, uh, conditions that they prefer, or cloudy day, and so on. Now, if you found value in this video, give me a thumbs up and consider subscribing to my channel. Meanwhile, remember to post your questions below and check out the resources that I've linked in the description. And I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.